you already know. It's the Joe Kingdom perspective. So uh, I'm, I'm calling the audible here. Um, we were just talking about uh, perichoresis and the dance, and um, uh, uh, Matt was talking about Richard Rohr and how uh, you know he illustrated it as you know if you're at the ball. And, but you're posted up against the wall, you're not joining the dance. And then Jason said, and a lot of people just don't know that they're invited to dance. And bro, like immediately the testimony you just shared with me this morning about the people in Nepal. And uh, wow. would you be down to share that story? Oh, I'd love to. It's such an incredible story. So within the context of people that just don't know that they're invited, finding out that they're invited, dude, let's do it. Yeah, where would you like for me to start from? At the beginning. At the beginning. Yeah, yeah, we got time. All right, so... I was really fortunate in 2007 to go to Kathmandu, Nepal, and that alone was such an incredible experience. So we, the team that I was with was sitting in this restaurant one day, and there was this demonstration going on on the, the main street through the center of the city, and we asked this pastor that was with us, what is this? What's going on? And they said, this is a, a terrorist group, uh, a group of Maoists that had come into the city. They had actually overthrew the king and they were setting up a new form of government at that time. And they were, you know, just looking for trouble pretty much. So, you know, that was, I had no point of reference for that. So but other than, yeah, we probably should go back to our hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that the next day we were having this open air crusade and there was around a, a thousand or so people there and an orphanage was there. And during that time, one of the guys from our, our team, he wasn't really used to speaking in foreign countries, especially foreign countries that has a, another predominant religion other than Christianity. And I guess we really failed to tell him, you know, <laughs> Let's talk about Jesus. <laughs> Let's not talk about Hinduism, Buddhism, or any other thing else. Let's just, you know, let's just stay, you know, for the, for the day. Let's just stay with, what else would you want to talk about anyway? <laughs> Besides Jesus, you know. <laughs> he didn't do that. So uh, <laughs> he started going down this road where he was speaking negatively against Hindu gods. And it started riling some people up who happened to know the Maoists yeah. and got in touch with them. It's like, Hey, you know, you might want to come here and check out what's going on. And word got back to the pastor he was with that this terrorist group is now coming to join us. So, and they're looking for Westerners. So they load us up into the van and get us out of there. And I didn't know what was going on at the time. And finally they told us a couple of days later, I'm back on the plane going to the States. So seven years later, I, that's all I really heard about that situation. Seven years later, I'm sitting in a little village in Serbia called Ponchevo and totally unrelated to Nepal, the people I was with, I was with another group of guys and the pastor in this Serbian town that we were staying with, he come and said, Hey, I know this group from Germany. This, they're a lovely couple. They take young men and women under their wing and teach them about foreign missions. They're traveling through Serbia and uh, they're going to come and stay with us for a couple of days. You know, me and Steve Burris, who was, I was with, we're like, great. I'd love to meet them. So that night we're all just sitting around talking and we're like, hey, what's been going on with you guys? Where y'all been? Tell us your story. And they were telling us about different places throughout Europe and Asia. And he said, you know, but uh, the furthest we've really been out was uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. And I was like, cool, man. I've been there. You know, tell me about it. He said, well, it was in 2007. I was like, awesome. I was there in 2007. <laughs> He's like, really? I was there the first week of November 2007. I was too. <laughs> it's like, I know it's a big place, but I'm surprised we didn't cross paths. He said, yeah, well, it wasn't at first a great experience for us because we were getting ready to go trek to base camp below Mount Everest. And he said, we went out of Kathmandu to this little village and this group of Maoist terrorists found us. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, 
oh no <laughs> <laughs> they were looking for us and they found you and he's like yeah they kidnapped us wow hmm. Hmm. took us he said we got up close to base camp because they took us way up in the himalaya mountains to this little remote village and they had already hired a sherpa to help them get up there this sherpa could speak english and their native nepalese tongue they had already got all the trekking gear like twenty thousand dollars of worth of rented equipment to go up into the himalayan mountains and that's all they had so this group took everything and took them up there and they were just sitting in this little shack you know didn't know what's going on but the sherpa could speak the language that this, the maoists were speaking and they were arguing for about two days on what to do with these people because they thought oh these guys are westerners they got to be rich Right. Well, they found out they don't have any money. Right. <laughs> and what would have been worse if it had kidnapped me? <laughs> <laughs> then they would have really been disappointed. <laughs> so um, they were sitting there and the Sherpa said, oh, you know, we probably should pray. Uh, and this guy was not a believer, the Sherpa. Right. He's like, we probably should pray. They're debating on whether they should kill us or not. Wow. Hmm. So I was like, yeah, I agree. We should pray. <laughs> <laughs> they did. So the next morning, they were, they were very angry. They, the, the, the terrorist group, the Maoists, were, had came there and to them, rounded them up, took them outside, made them sit down, and they was like, oh, this is it. And they were demanding to have everything. And it's like, listen, this is all we have. They gave them their wallets. They went through everything, and they took all their gear, and they were just arguing amongst themselves you know, pretty violently. And this went on for another day. And they just continued to pray. It's like, you know, Lord, you've got us here. We, we know we followed you here. Yeah. Something's got to be going on with this. The next morning they woke up, they were gone. Took all their equipment. Right, right, right. And, but hey, that, was, that was, you know, good. Right. But they were gone. Right. Thing is, though, they were there up in the Himalayan mountains. November is already starting to get cold with nothing but just, you know, jeans and a T-shirt. Hmm. In this very, very remote group of Nepalese people that had never been off that mountain. Not only had they had never been off their mountain, they could trace their lineage for thousands and thousands of years. And no one had ever really been off that mountain that they had known of. They were so remote and such an ancient people that they would steal at night. They would still have like a bonfire in, in the, the center of the village and all of them would still come out and tell stories and sing songs and dance around the fire. You know how like old storytellers would do in, in antiquity and they would do that. So this group of, of German people, they were saying that we were just sitting there. There's nothing that we could do. And we were watching this and it was, was, was beautiful. It was like, you know, 5000 BC or something. Right. They were just dancing around the fire and telling stories. And it hit him. It is like he said uh, to the Sherpa that was there, "Do you know what they're singing about?" And he said, "Yeah, they're, it's a it's an old song about the creation of this world." But the thing is, the song is like they believe that somebody created this, but they have no idea why. But they're just singing and celebrating the creation of all of this. <laughs> He's like, really. <laughs> Can you interpret for me? And he's like, sure. He said, okay, let's do this. Because I can tell him why. <laughs> so this guy starts to tell them not that in the beginning, there was, there was this creator, but he had a son and, and a spirit. And he started teaching them about the Trinity and that they were in such a, love with one another is like we've got to share this with other people so that was boom creation was the love that was in the father's heart it was just needs to be spread out through the universe so he begins to tell them that and they're like wait a minute he had a son <laughs> and they're, they're, he said the whole village was just just listening and soaking in everything he said. Mm -hmm. So he began to walk them through the love of God on how he created, why he created, and that 
there was a veil upon humanity's eyes that couldn't be seen. And, and Jesus come to take that veil off so that they can be see the Father and yeah. be brought back into this beautiful dance that they were doing <laughs> and how this is dance has always been going on yeah. for eternity. Yeah. And you're included in it. <laughs> and they are going nuts. They are they so <laughs> happy. They are just dancing and spinning around. He's like, man, this is awesome. So he kept on talking about, you know, Jesus's ministry and then how that he was betrayed and he died on a cross and everything stopped. And they're like, what? They became irate, mm. mad to where they were actually considering killing them. The, the villagers were because you tell us mm. this beautiful story mm. and that the creator had a son and then. They killed him? What, right. what, what do you mean? Right. And he's like, no, no, please, just stop. The story doesn't end there. <laughs> he did that on purpose because he knew that if you go to a place, there's no place that I would let you go to that I wouldn't go there to. Wow. And he said, they didn't want you to have to go to death, to hell, or anything like that. <laughs> and so he goes there and he destroys all of that. He, he gets the keys and destroys every bit of that. And he was resurrected and the place went nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, okay, okay, this is a good story again. <laughs> and he said, the story doesn't stop there. You're included in this. And he begins to tell them, you know, about this relationship. And these people had never heard of it. And they were just going nuts to the interpreter. who wasn't a believer was telling the story through tears yeah. because he had never heard it either. Right. And, they threw this whole event, this primitive people just absorbed this message. Not only did they believe it, they really could understand it, I believe, more than a lot of us yeah. in the modern Western world because they already knew the dance, yeah. you know? So. They already knew this, this <laughs> rhythm on. of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on how this works. and. They, they were just living in this communal life, yeah. and only thing that they needed was this story. You already know, it's the Joe Kingdom Perspective.